Uh, hi, my name is Rodrigo. Uh, I just would like to question. Sp speak my... loud because it doesn't okay. work. Okay, sorry. Then my name is Rodrigo. I would like to maybe question two things. One of them is to make the correlation between a life expense, ex expectancy, expectancy, and uh, demography in general with uh, the problem. I think that we need to be very careful when we make these correlations, like uh, we are growing up in population, and because of that, uh, the environment are pushing back. Uh, because it can, people can use it for many devastate kind of demo, uh, theories like uh, population uh, control and other kind of uh, theories. Then I think that we need to be careful. And also when we make a comparison between the number of population and the consumption of uh, who are the population that are really doing the climate crisis, then we see that the problem is not really the population itself, but uh, the amount of consumption that a part of the population uh, do to the environment and not the number of the population itself. Then I, yeah, I would be maybe more careful. And also when you put the statistics about the Africa, that uh, they may be the African continent or South uh, uh, countries can be l less harmful for the COVID crisis. It also can be an argument for the European countries to do not break the rights, the property rights of the patents because, oh, they are more resistant or it's less harmful for them. And then we need to protect ourselves, what it's uh, occurring now, and it's a big problem. Then, uh, yeah, I, for everything that you see, thank you, first of all, uh, for all the exposition, but uh, maybe this two points can be yeah. a bit uh, problematic. You are, you are touching a very interesting point. The first one is a question of, uh, um, again, uh, it's a question of coherence. Do you want to put all the factors, all the possible integrated and interacting factors into the understanding or not? And it's a question which is both scientific and politic. Political one. It means that when you have understood, then you act. How do you act? Depends on your interpretation of the fact. And that's politics. And this is going everywhere. We have seen usage of scientific facts in all directions. We have seen it for all the centuries and all the uh, horrors that we've seen. The question is, where do we get? Do we have the, uh, again, the decency to make that from the point of what is linked to what? What I mentioned, networks, complex systems, and so on. Is demography a factor? Obviously it is. Do we want to deal with that? Can we deal with that? That's another question. But the first one is, how is that working inside? Is it a complement or not? There is a very strange relation, for example, that you can see, which is a true one and an understandable one. When you increase the size, the height, okay, and the weight of a population, it's because you are bringing food inside the global system for decades, years and years and years. Okay? So uh, pregnant women eat better, they have better system for the young uh, infants developing. The young kids, when uh, at the most important part of their life, increase their rate and go up maybe to some kind of limits to the maximal height of humanity. Maybe. That's the question we're asking every time. Are there limited numbers? I mean, we know that the record is 2 meters 72. 2 meters 72. That's seven. 52 centimeters higher. It's even higher than my figure. There. No one went six meters high. No one. Okay. So there is a limit somewhere. Okay. And you have a huge amount of diseases when you reach those numbers. This is not normal in terms of physiological normality, whatever this means. Okay. 
But there is a relation with an increased height, a mean height in the population, the one I mentioned, which was saturating also. Okay? Uh, and the number of people inside the population, not in a single country. You have to understand that at the species level. What is our genome? We are sharing our genome. We are in the common race, the common species, the common future. We have to understand that and not cutting that in pieces to say, well, we will advantage, we will refuse from that point or another. That's a question of decision, of political interpretation that you will make from that. Number. But there is a huge relation of energy, increase of height, increase of numbers inside a population. And you see that not only in the human species, but in all others where this has been shown. When you see uh, the small marmot de Californie, uh, they grow through the uh, increase of uh, the uh, period of uh, nutrition they grew up, they increased their numbers. When you have that, and you can uh, check those relations uh, two by two in many other circumstances, it provides an argument. It doesn't say this is the truth. We are not saying this is something which is. This is dealing with how confident you are with the data. Okay? And you can see that most of the reports now are saying this is a high, a medium, a low degree of confidence. Okay? It's because when you are adding year after year uh, observation that are always going in the same direction, well, you say that you should be. So it means that if you see that demography is one of the key factors, you need to understand if this will be for the future an aggravated or a facilitating factor and how this will change. Then the question of dealing with demography is almost unsolvable unsolvable in most of the places. China uh, tried to do that with the one-child policy. It went up and uh, cleft out that uh, policy uh, years ago because it was no longer, and in fact, it was increasing the aging process of the Chinese population. So they are now afraid of not having enough uh, young people, the case of Japan, for example, right now which is reducing its population at a very, very high pace because it's too old and people are no longer um, having kids to be above the 2.1 uh, rate, which would make the renewal. But the question is, do we want? I mean, a lot of uh, uh, our uh, kids are now asking what would be the... Uh, environment that uh, will be the, the one we will left uh, to uh, we leave to our uh, kids and then asking uh, the question of uh, what is uh, the real deep root of our decision to have kids or not so it's much more now uh, an individual question inside an environment which is very quickly changing i've seen that with all that question of the future that make the decision Maybe there was a part of how, how to translate those, those data, those no, this knowledge into policy. And when you say population is an issue, uh, then within this population, there are, so to what extent the scientists you are, the scientists the IPCC uh, are gathering, are also uh, in charge of providing elements that would help translating into policy that not be yeah. that of the population in general. It's a very difficult question which is on the tables because when you have that and not, not all the uh, questions are dealing with the elements I um, mentioned today. Okay? Um, but when you have that then is what are the principles for actions? And the principle are that exact second part of your question, which is what justice? What is uh, the way of having uh, the uh, repartition of constraint? When uh, we see that uh, the one that have benefited the most of the developing process in the 19th century and 20th century, and now 
being at the higher uh, and the top of the list, do they let the other one coming up? The question is, this question of justice is decorrelated from what is the global future of humanity? Because now the question is not what, what, what was happening before, is what happens now, what happens next. And then the question of justice is just a question of survival again. I put that in under three lines, but it was a very difficult question when I addressed that question inside the APCC because a lot of people, and I understand totally that, will say, no, we have to share the constraint. Well, it might be, but it might be the contrary. We don't know exactly where the pathway, the pathway of survival is. And it's a true survival. It's no longer a question of being at 1.5 or 2 or 4 Celsius degree. It's a question of, you've seen the last wave, the biodiversity. Are we in the cart? Are we in the, uh, the railing train? If this is the case, we need to understand that and then act. Can we act with all the justice that is required to do that? It's a question that uh, many governments don't want to address. And the question of the COVID vaccine that you mentioned is exactly the demonstration of it. We won't pay for that. We say it. We said there will be some financial compensation in the uh, COP process, but we will deal with that in the next one, in 27, the 28, the 29. Okay, we won't. We won't deal with that, definitely. So it's a question of... Uh, okay, uh, first of all, thank you very much. This was a lot. Uh, and also the answer now, I think I forgot about half of my question. Um, but if I remember correctly, I wanted to go like a little into like the complex systems theory. I like to think about tipping points a lot. It's a very important concept for me also. I'm from the Alps in Austria, so every spring I would wait for summer and check the mountain and when the snow was gone, there was one or two more weeks when the cold water would come down and then kind of the buffering effect was over and summer would come really quick and really fast. And now seeing you having like this holistic kind of idea about so many things, I wanted to ask you, do you see on the horizon any like tipping points that not only are going to be crucial but that we can still somewhat avoid? And secondly, do you have any um, advice to attempt the prediction of like tipping points or something like this that could be applied like more like as a methodological kind of, of package? So yeah. Well, w one of the points to answer your uh, direct uh, observation of the uh, Austrian glacier, if I understand properly, is what is going on to the uh, Arctic and the Antarctic one. And the major tipping point might be there meaning if it is going to, to, to uh, melt down completely, it's going to be done in five uh, centuries, uh, 10 centuries, not in the next decades. But at the end, there will be 120 meters up. So it's uh, the, 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 the huge change that uh, we will have at the end of the process, no longer uh, allow for what we are uh, experiencing now from uh, our shores uh, in uh, the Plage de la Boule uh, on uh, the uh, Atlantic littoral uh, in Biscarros uh, uh, or any places in, in the world. So it's going to be underwater for London, you've seen. It's just at the end of the century if the four Celsius degree is reached. So meaning we are continuing on the business as usual pathway. Uh, the question of tipping points will be more uh, on this element when this process is engaged. And if it is the case, you can no longer act on it. It's done. And it's results, and that's what I was mentioning, it is resulting from what has happened in the last two centuries. So this is the increased energy amount and what the process, the biospherical process that have been changed, altered, that are now working by themselves, that will make uh, those options available, changeable, or not. If some are, and that's why we have to understand where it is possible to act, then if it is uh, 
playable. We have to play. We have to make it. The question is then how to make the political process so 8 billion people do it. So far, nobody does, I say. Well, one of, uh, above uh, a million. So meaning not enough. Really, nothing has really changed. And the uh, pathways are showing, well, what was uh, designed uh, 40 years ago by uh, Meadows. I mean, there were six way working and uh, on, on computers that were even not uh, portable. <laughs> they, they saw what was possibly uh, on track. So the question is really make those elements and where we can act, we have to. How is then the purpose of the third chapter of the IPCC report, the AR6? Uh, that will be what are the political solutions. And you will see that the political solutions are far away from what the first chapter will say, has said in uh, August. Well, it is moving faster. Be cautious. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation, it too. I don't think it is. But it's Except for recording. For yeah, it does work. It does work. For the yeah, recording, please. yes. So my name is Eloisa, I come from Brazil, and uh, I have two questions. Uh, one regards, um, you presented uh, the developing process as the cause of the demographic growth you are experiencing, the right? demographic? Like, yeah, the, the demographic, like the population growth, yeah, growth. It, as a consequence of our uh, developing process in the past few centuries. It's part of it. Yeah. But it's I was wondering what is like if one thing led to the other, should uh, policy tackle first the developing process or the population growth? And what policy would you suggest? And also, I wanted to make a comment and a brief question as well. Like, I was a bit, um, I'm a bit worried with those types of uh, interpretations uh, when it comes to life expectancy. Because, like, uh, following up a bit Rodrigo, like, um, when you say that uh, as people are living longer, older people have more vulnerabilities, so there are more risks of systemic crisis, such as the health crisis we are living now. But also, like, we see, like, the comor comorbidities, all this, it's also uh, associated with the developing process we have, right? Of the agricultural, uh, industrial agricultural process we have, the food we eat, the pesticides we just saw. So, is it, it, uh, it doesn't it like leaves a margin for an ageism, you know, like to blame the, the older for, uh, for bringing about this crisis? And also, um, uh, that other question, if you could address, what is it, the policy you suggest either for changing the developing process or uh, population growth, whatever is more important for you? Well, again, it's a question of honesty. What do you observe? How can you not conclude? Uh, I'm not providing conclusion. I am providing elements of reflection. Uh, what I see and how I understand it is that way. I may be totally wrong. I'm just giving, providing how I make those connections and uh, try to enlighten those interdependencies. Well, that's the way I, I work. That's, I think, what I was asked. <laughs> but the question is now, uh, for the first point on demography, uh, can you really play on that? And in fact, when you are looking through the uh, 19th and 20th century in the developing and the ranging, it's always the same process. First, you have a reduction of mortality rate. And then you have a reduction of fertility rate. Meaning you need to have the observation by your population of an increasing number of people all around to say, well, maybe we will reduce the number of children we want to have. I don't know how it works. I don't know through what psychological, sociological, but then that's anthropological way of studying that. I don't know how it works. It's all over country. It has never been different. It's always the first reduction of mortality rate because you have made progresses against infectious diseases, 
uh, through the malnutrition programs. You bring energy, food inside, and then you reduce the mortality rate. And one generation later, roughly, it's at 20, between 10 and 30 years later, but all the curves in all countries are always separated. You have the reduction of the uh, number of children, that is. And the difference is, is the exact increasing number uh, of so what uh, we call uh, le sol de naturel in French. I don't know how you would translate that, but the natural growth of your population. Obviously, if this is the other way, then you reduce your population. And this might be what we will observe in the 21st century. If the mortality rate is increasing due to all the risks that we have seen, then we will have maybe an increase in the fertility rate one generation later. But so far, this is going the other way. The mortality is increasing while the natality is, uh, being, uh, is decreasing. And you can see that in Japan, you can see that in Europe, you can see that in France, the two curves might cross in the next years. Uh, it means that the natural growth of the population is changing now. And the first example is Japan. Do you work on that? Did it work in the 19th century when nobody was observing that? We can do that because we have the science and the tools, the technological tools to interrogate those moments. Now, but it was not the case in the 19th century. People were just trying to survive, point trying to make some policies uh, to uh, reduce the press influence or uh, making the wars uh, through Napoleon Wars and uh, Bismarck and everything in Europe that we have known. Not people, nobody was uh, looking at how to make intelligent proposition to a population to increase, except of uh, trying to have the best moments to do it. So historically, we can expect to have um, social consequences of decisions, but they are not uh, linearly related. Again, these are not the first effect that you are expected when you see what politics were uh, given. And especially because the interpretation also were completely different. In the 19th century, you were expecting those elements uh, in terms of fish, for example. I've shown you how this has been reduced. But you can have one of the most important uh, uh, writer in France, um, Alexandre Dumas, the one who wrote uh, Les Trois Mousquetaires and so on, uh, who said, well, maybe because we are now observing an increase of the number of fishes in the harbor of, uh, I don't remember if this was uh, uh, Honfleur or uh, Le Havre, and saying, well, in a few uh, years, we will be able to cross the Atlantic Ocean just by walking on fishes. <laughs> Written by just an absolute contradistinction with what the reality is in terms of regulation of species, regulation of prey and predators, the regulation of the fishing mass you are extracting from it, and, and, and the renewal of another species, which has also its own problem, demographic problem, how to survive under the human pressure. All these questions are linked together. I'm not sure any uh, of the policies that were taken in the 19th and the 20th century was helping to increase the uh, natality when they were uh, then observing that it was uh, uh, reduced uh, as compared to what was uh, going on in the uh, 18th and 17th century. Not sure. Yes, um, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm, I'm Luca and uh, I'm, I, I just got a little bit curious about, yeah, your arguments of like, or I don't know, also maybe the um, the baby boomer generation or like this whole discussion on it. And um, I'm not sure that if the point that I'm making can be strictly related to this, but since we're economists, I would like to introduce a bunch of more variables to this discussion and think about it like from maybe also a labor perspective in the sense uh, and connected to, yeah, social movements and people moving across countries and how that, I mean, yeah, in, econ in terms of economics changes the, the proportions of labor employed, but also in terms of um, people migrating and the, the general 
population um, as such. And I would, um, I'm not sure if I, <laughs> I have a pregnant like a question on this because I can see that introducing this like yeah to other variables, it's it's kind of shifting the focus a little bit. But if you can imagine this, yeah element of mobi social, mob not social mobility, but mobility True would mobility. have an impact on, um, yeah, the, the reproduction that we're, you were mentioning before. Okay. In terms of demography, this is the natural evolution, the sol de naturel, which is uh, the difference of mortality and natality rate. Huh? And then you have the migratory uh, sol, uh, the um, expansion when a country allows uh, people to come into uh, its own territory. Uh, you have seen how, again, these policies in Europe, in the different countries, just in Europe, uh, are dealt with, or how the previous administration in the US were dealing with that. So those elements are changing a lot what would be the political and social context to try to deal with that. It won't change the global pictures in terms of the humanity all over the planet. It means that things may be uh, changed and you might have the uh, ideal situation by being able to block any motion. That's what Japan said and put in place for many years. Or that's what was New Zealand just did for a year and a half with the pandemic. Just say, no one is getting out, no one is uh, coming in except the old blacks that can sometimes get out to play rugby in Europe. But uh, that's it. I mean, the, uh, you may have geographical and environmental conditions that help you to make a decision. In Europe, you can do that. You cannot. Despite the political uh, emotion, I would say, uh, represented by a few of the next candidates through our uh, presidential election, uh, you cannot play that. You may have the Tuke agreement, you may have the Schengen uh, frontiers, you may provide anything. Things are coming in. So it will change through other uh, conditions rather than the political ones. It will be the economical condition. Are you safe in your country? Uh, are you being able to dream your future in your country? Why do you want to move? Because it's just, yeah. and is the future better uh, here than it used to be uh, before. It really depends on all these elements. And, and even when you choose to leave, you may not have the real purpose, the real element to make your proper decision because you don't know how tough it will be when you arrive. But it's going to be always the uh, drivers. Again, the question of drivers is uh, one, uh, the one that uh, I showed in the early uh, uh, one else uh, working group, but those drivers, it means that there are pressures and difference of pressure uh, here and there. And those difference of pressure are getting motion between people, inside people, between species, between uh, plants and uh, animals. I mean, it's always working that way and in social terms, yes. It end up with, well, there are motions, there are changes of uh, people migrating. It has always been in the 19th century how the U.S. were uh, um, uh, opening their doors for uh, Irish people after the famine in uh, 47. It's, uh, you see, all, all, all those elements will be uh, if I important. May, if I may, No, because I think essentially for the question was whether like all these social conditions can also have an impact in, in terms of um, yeah the whole demography and and not only considering like this um, biological aspects of like uh, again I don't say all this is summarized under the few elements very small number of elements I gave you today again. This is clear for me. These are only a few of them. Only a few of them, okay? Mm -hmm. We cannot summarize. And again, what was um, the purpose of the Meadows report uh, almost 50 years ago? 
they didn't say, well, this is one element on pollution, one element on demography, one element. They said, well, there are a few of major variables. Can we make a few scenarios that would help to understand uh, in what direction we are going? Uh, well, they were not far from the truth, okay? despite they had just a few. So it means that uh, a few of them are uh, providing uh, some keys but they are not summarizing the complexity of, uh, of life. I don't say that. But if I may, when you mentioned the migration in the US from Ireland to the US, etc., there is a major difference also now facing climate change, which is related to physio physiology too. Which is, I mean, when there is, uh, I mean, you can deal with uh, heat 45 degrees in Seville because the air is dry. But when the, you have lots of humidity and you have this humid heat, like it may happen, and it's still, it's already happened a little bit this year, but it will happen much more in the next decades, especially in India, in part of India and Pakistan. Pakistan. I mean, the impacts, I mean, it means that for weeks, you, can, you cannot live you cannot just in that live. part. Of, yeah. So the, the change is, is that you may have climate migration, but climate migration not because of a, a hurricane, climate uh, migration because you just cannot okay. live for a few weeks in your country, so in that case... And it will yeah. be the case in the Middle East. And it will Even be the case in the Middle East. So, so it concerns seen. lots of population, so we, there is an issue of dealing with that, and, uh, and there are two different ways to, to, to deal with that. So the, the Trump way, <laughs> and maybe another way. And I don't know to, to what extent these type of things are also discussed within IPCC, uh, not maybe entirely the political issue, but I mean, this, this major change uh, in those parts of the, the world, which concern three, four hundred millions of people who will not be able to live in their country, means that uh, we have to do something to, to and to share what remains of the world uh, habitable. No? Uh, it, has, it is addressed in the third chapter, the third group, uh, the IPCC. Uh, what are the, I would say, the sustainable uh, policy, political solutions, uh, or I would say the options. Uh, and, and, and it's a very tough discussion because uh, all countries, um, states and governments just don't want to let things uh, going too far, uh, both in terms of actions, but even in terms of uh, understanding. So when we are bringing questions like that, it's like, what happened? Don't worry. We are not dealing with the extinction. We are not dealing with survival. We are just dealing with our own survival as a government for the next three years, the next five months. Okay, that's the way uh, things are brought. Uh, and then uh, you have uh, longer terms for people that are not in the democracies and try to bring stability or <laughs> closing of the ideas and the borders. Well, um, I don't know if there are large pathways for uh, making those elements inside the uh, large institution such as UN, uh, the WHO for health and uh, many of those because again what makes the last uh, point is the political decision and then you will come back to uh, other regulated systems, other factors that make the decision uh, and uh, other consideration of what the, uh, their own reality is. So at the end, you have to make the, uh, the addition of all these motions. He wants to go there, this one wants to go here, this government there. The, the. What is the ending of that? It is here plus there plus there plus there. Okay, zero. No motion at all. You see, at the end, you may have some results like that. And sometimes you may have one, two, three, four, okay, it goes in a direction. Maybe you should have gone that way and we decided to go there. You will know much later. But sometimes if you 
think science observation can bring a few correct ideas of how the world is going, maybe sometimes it can provide uh, the right cause of action. Let's be optimistic. So it's very, very optimistic. <laughs> Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you You're very welcome. much.